This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report, as we move now into our last segment. We end today's show with a look at David versus Goliath, a case heard by the Supreme Court Tuesday that pitted a 75-year-old farmer from Indiana against Monsanto, the world's largest seed company. The dispute began when soybean farmer Vernon Bowman bought and planted a mix of unmarked grain typically used for animal feed. The plants that grew turned out to contain the popular herbicide-resistant genetic trait known as Roundup Ready that Monsanto guards closely with patents. Monsanto accused Bowman of using using their technology without paying for it. Their contracts with farmers give them the exclusive rights to supply the Roundup Ready soybeans. They sued Bowman for patent infringement. Well, on Wednesday, I spoke about this case, how it could impact corporate control of the world's food supply, with Debbie Barker, program director of Save Our Seeds and international director of the Center for Food Safety. She co-authored a new report called Seed Giants versus U.S. Farmers. I spoke with her, along with Nermeen Sheikh of Democracy Now!, um, this is what she had to say. Of course, the case, it's hard to know exactly how the Supreme Court will end up ruling, whether it be narrow or broadly. Um, but the reason why we wrote an amicus brief and then wrote this report supporting um, Hugh Bowman is to point out the fact that that, unfortunately, th this is a microcosm of a bigger issue of um, seed patenting and the question of who should own the right to products of life, if you will, or living organisms. So, for example, um, Monsanto has already sued around 100—has about 144 lawsuits involving about 406 farmers and about 50-plus small farm businesses across 27 states. And they have farmers have already paid Monsanto in these cases about $28 million. And then, of course, there are thousands of cases that are settled out of court where Monsanto comes after farmers to um, uh, investigate them for seed patent, alleged seed patent infringement. And they've had thousands of um, cases. Our report and investigation, investigation has shown um, thousands of cases settled out of court in confidential um, arrangements. So this has um, implications um, not only for farmers, but rural America, and as well, as I said, the question of who should be owning seeds. And right now, a handful of corporations, say the top three agrochemical corporations, control 53—approximately 53 percent of commercial global sell of seeds. And we think that that has broader socioeconomic issues, and that's what this report um, and our amicus brief in the case of Bowman um, discusses. And Debbie Barker, uh, one of the lawyers for Monsanto, Seth Waxman, uh, he said during the Supreme Court hearing, quote, without the ability to limit reproduction of soybeans containing this patented trait, Monsanto could not have commercialized its invention and never would have produced what is by now the most popular agricultural technology in America. Could you respond to that? Well, first of all, I think um, to talk about why is that the most popular agriculture product, um, one of the situations we have is because of the current seed um, patenting regime that gives exclusive rights to companies like Monsanto, you have a situation where, as I said, there's a handful of companies controlling the rights to seeds and germplasm, and this leads to, obviously, market concentration. And um, with that, we've seen an incredible increase increase in the price of seeds, for example, in soybean. In the last decade, there's been a 325 percent increase in seeds. Now, what many farmers told us in our Seed Giants investigation report is that um, they're not necessarily—I mean, they're kind of held hostage, that not only have the seed prices have gone up, but when they don't want these kinds of seeds, and maybe they want to go back to other seeds or conventional seeds that were available before the GM soy seed, it's not— really available on the market. So when the companies, they've invested a lot in the innovation uh, or the uh, the research and development on this GE soybean. So to recoup the investment, one of the ways of doing that is kind of cornering the market or, or making sure that that is almost the only option available to farmers. The report has these stunning figures—86 percent of corn, 88 percent of cotton, 93 percent of soybeans farmed in the U.S. are now genetically engineered. 
Making, That's correct, yeah. So if you want non-genetically engineered crops, um, uh, it is very difficult to get them here. Yes, it's very difficult. We've had, you know, anecdotal uh, stories with the farmers that we talk to that will say, you know, when we've asked our, our seed supplier, our licensee of Monsi, to get us uh, just conventional seeds, and they'll say, oh, well, perhaps they're ready, but you might miss a planting season, and no farmer can afford to do that. So that's the kind of situation that they're put in. Let me get your response um, to Monsanto's statement about this case. Uh, David Snively, I'm not sure how you pronounce his name, it might be Snively. Mm -hmm. Executive Vice President and General Counsel for Monsanto said the case, quote, highlights the importance of intellectual property protection and supporting America's continued investments in breakthrough 21st century technologies that support the increasing demands of our planet and our people. Uh, Debbie Barker, your response. Well, a couple of responses. Uh, one is, as I said in our report, we try and show these broader socioeconomic implications. One would be um, this increase in um, the price of seeds, and we think that such an increase, if that's the model, not only has that been devastating to many farmers in the U.S., but if we have a model in which we want to say we want to feed the planet with such crops, and it's expensive for the farmers to buy these seeds, you extract that model or export it to developing countries where farmers who formerly saved their own seeds and didn't have to pay for seeds are now having to pay this huge cost for the seeds, in addition to the chemicals, the high cost of the chemicals it takes to have this combination. We feel that that's not really the best model to go forward um, to feed the world. But on top of that, we would say that to date, and we've had two decades now in the U.S. of um, GE crops, and there have only been uh, — there are no traits of enhanced nutrition. There are no traits for drought-resistant crops. There, in fact, um, even in the case in the hearing yesterday, the attorney said, in fact, that the soybeans do not have any increased yield. So that kind of takes the steam out of they, they've admitted that they don't increase yields, and therefore, it's not really a crop that could feed the world, because it doesn't show increased yields, say, compared to a conventional or then, of course, even an organic or sustainable agroecological -eco system. Debbie Barker, Program Director of Save Our Seeds and International Director of the Center for Food Safety, co-authored a new report called Seed Giants versus U.S. Farmers. We'll link to it on our website at democracynow.org. If you'd like a copy of today's show, you can go to our website at democracynow.org. Demo Thanks so much for watching this report from Democracy Now!, your daily independent global news hour. We don't accept advertising or corporate funding, but rather rely on donations from viewers like you. Please make your contribution by visiting democracynow.org. We need your support today to keep bringing you this hard-hitting, in-depth reporting.